Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming to our second workshop uh, on the Berek accessibility. Uh, um, I'm uh, very pleased that I uh, see you all here. I hope we'll have a very interesting uh, session and uh, we'll uh, get acquainted to uh, some good measures dedicated to uh, ensuring uh, equivalence of access to uh, disabled uh, end users. Uh, for the opening remarks, uh, I will invite uh, Professor uh, Fatima Baros. She is the chairman of ANACOM, and this w as well, she is uh, the chairman of BEREC, uh, and she will uh, give us, she will open the, she will open the, the conference. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's for me a great pleasure to be here today and to welcome you to Berek's second workshop on accessibility. In Berek, one of our three strategic pillars is to empower and protect end users. And this workshop will help us to collect views, enrich our work, and therefore assist us in the implementation of our strategy in a more efficient way. As you know, more than 25% of the European Union population is affected by long-term disabilities. Considering the visible aging of the European population, this proportion is expected to increase substantially in the next 20, 25 years. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance to enable disabled uh, citizens to engage as much as possible in the workforce and to enjoy the same opportunities regarding education, health, culture, information, and leisure, the same that are available to the European citizens in general. Considering the high impact of electronic communications and ICTs in our lives, and this is, of course, increasing, we need to guarantee to the European disability strategy, that the European disability strategy is implemented with due consideration of the universalization of access to electronic communications and ICTs to the disabled end users. Additionally, affordability is a key aspect. Disabled citizens' poverty rate is 70% above the average of the population. And of course, we must take this into account. In this context, it is relevant to highlight that European regulatory framework for electronic communications, and in particular, the 2002 Universal Service Directive, already encompassed a set of provisions focused in the promotion of equivalent access by disabled citizens. But in this case, I would like to stress some uh, special measures, like the implementation of special measures with respect to provision of access to a fixed location, as well as a directory inquiry services and directories in accordance with the universal service obligations. Also, the accessibility of public paid telephones to disabled end users based on the reason, reasonable needs of end users. And also, the affordability of universal service. And the possibility that member states take specific measures so that end users with disabilities can also take advantage of the choice of undertakings and service providers. It is worthwhile noticing that the 2009 review of the Universal Service Directive brought the possibility of additional measures to be implemented, particularly with respect to equivalent access and choice for end users with disabilities. In particular, upon assessing the general need and specific requirements of measures 
I would like to stress um, some of the issues where the national authorities are um, involved. And uh, somehow national authorities are enabled to specify the requirements to be met by electronic communication service providers to ensure access and choice equivalent to that enjoyed by the majority of end users. National authorities shall encourage the availability of terminal equipment offering the necessary services and functions. And of course, national authorities may oblige undertakings to regularly inform disabled subscribers of products and services that are specifically designed for them. In addition, the roaming regulation mandates home operators to provide blind or partially sight customers <coughs> with basic personalized and automatic pricing information by voice call, free of charge, if it is requested by the end user. Berek is clearly engaged in assessing how these regulatory provisions are implemented through e Europe. But even more, Berek is engaged in analyzing and sharing best practices from NRAs and or market agents that clearly contribute towards equivalent access. The previous Berek report 2011 was entitled Electronic Communication Services, Ensuring Equivalence in Access and Choice for Disabled <coughs> End Users, as well as the 2013 Berec Accessibility Workshop, so the one that was run two years ago, were considered landmarks, offering valuable insights on how to further develop equivalent access and hence improve disabled uh, citizens' lives. This is our responsibility. Try to improve the quality of life of our citizens that are facing more difficulties. And we expect that during this, uh, this workshop, we'll have an open discussion. And we want to use the results that we'll get from the today's workshop to feed uh, the update of the previous barracks report, so the one that we had from 2011, and we plan to have a final report delivered by the end of this year. It's very important for us to have the input and uh, the contribution from all of you to help us to develop our work. And uh, this is part of the um, strategy of Barak. We want to be open to all stakeholders. We want to listen to all stakeholders. And we want to gather all the information we can in order to develop our work. We are interested in the views of service providers, operators, application developers, consumer associations, disability associations, and relevant national authorities when updating this report. Ladies and gentlemen, at Berec, we are eager to listen to your views regarding the evolution of those key issues presented in the conclusions of our previous accessibility workshop. We count on your valuable contribution, participation, criticism, and feedback. Thank you so much, and enjoy the workshop. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to BEREC's workshop on accessibility. It is a great honor for me to act as facilitator at the first session of this workshop. And this works, uh, workshop aims to raise awareness on accessibility and usability in the electronic communication sector, and to enable regulators, authorities, providers, and manufacturers to take actions in order to support digital inclusion and create widely accessible communication services. Therefore, we very much value and appreciate your views in order to develop regulatory policies, telecommunication products and services that enable the participation of all. Within BEREC, we do believe that accessibility should concern not just the people with disabilities, but all of us. 
In our days, access to information and communication technologies are key enablers in the participation to a plethora of everyday activities. This session will try to identify the challenges faced by disabled users in accessing electronic communication services. It will assess the current level of accessibility and choice and will consider what more could be done. In Berwick, we want all citizens of Europe, no matter of their disabilities, to be able to enjoy the same benefits of our technological era and to participate on equal footing in all domains of everyday life. For all of us in Berwick, it is important to understand the challenges faced by disabled users. We have three distinguished speakers with us today. The first one is Mr. Odolfo Catani, who is the Secretary General of the European Disability Forum and the Chair of its ICT expert group. The European Disability Forum is an independent, non-governmental organization that represents the interest of European citizens with disabilities. The second speaker is Mr. David Hay, who is the Communication and Media Officer of the European Union of the Deaf, an organization that represents the interest of the deaf people and brings together national associations across the EU. The last speaker of the first session is Mr. Andreas Senderboom, who is uh, the head of accessibility on Funka Nu. Funka Nu is the market leader of accessibility in Sweden. They provide analysis, development, and education in accessibility. They also provide support, recommendation, and testing. And after this brief introduction, I would like to ask the first speaker, Mr. Catani, to start his presentation. Mr. Catani, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to check if uh, the technology for my slides is OK. Yes, sir. Okay. Your colleague has got already. OK, good morning. Thank you very much for it's not on. Ah, it's on now. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President. Uh, good morning to all of you. And thank you for inviting uh, European Disability Forum to this important uh, session. As already explained uh, by the facilitator, uh, European Disability Forum is uh, the voice of persons with disabilities in uh, the European Union. And we represent uh, more or less uh, 80 million persons with disabilities all over the European Union. EDF is composed of organizations of persons with disabilities and their parents. It's run by persons with uh, disabilities and uh, it promotes the human rights of persons with disabilities at all, at all level, in all sector of life. It's an advocacy organization at European level. It closely works with the European Union institutions, the Council of Europe, and also the United uh, Nations. So next uh, slide. I will say something now about the potential of telecommunications for persons with disabilities in order to introduce the issue from our perspective. It is clear and well known that in uh, information and communication technologies represent a real opportunity for uh, persons with disabilities to combat isolation and social exclusion and enable them to participate in all spheres of society of life and on, on an equitable basis with the persons who are not disabled. In the case of telecommunications, accessibility to and uh, affordability of networks and services, on one hand, is uh, on uh, the terminal equipment. And on the other hand, the requirements <coughs> in order to avoid that persons with disabilities are left aside in an increasingly connected uh, continent. So therefore, our main goal and the purpose also of Article 23, letter A of the Universal Service Directive is to ensure equal access and choice to networks, services, and the necessary equipment within this is very important, also affordable prices. Accessible e-communication products and services can enhance 
and do enhance the independent living of persons with disabilities, as well as their participation and inclusion in all aspects of life in our society. And furthermore, accessible services with accessible information about them can also enable persons with disabilities to enjoy the same level of choice than their peers. And last but not least, special attention should be given also to emergency services since many people live, uh, many people's lives depend on the accessibility of these services, not only of those with a disability, but also those who suffer of an impairment due to an emergency situation. And this is also supported by Article 9 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We should never forget that there has been a revolution in the disability, uh, in the disability movement with the, the ratification of this convention by the European Union. And uh, this article requires that accessibility should be uh, the main principle, that accessibility should be the fil rouge, so to say, among all the different, uh, the different situations in the life of persons with disabilities. Accessibility on an equal basis with other, on information, communications, other services, including electronic services and emergency services. Very clearly, it says it. And in addition, Article 9 also requires that states should provide to stakeholders on accessibility issues facing persons with disabilities and to promote other appropriate forms of assistance and support to persons with disabilities to ensure their access to information. You know, uh, that UNCRPD obligations are there, but uh, I would also like to uh, draw your attention to the UNCRPD committee uh, declaration focusing on Article 9 of the Convention. In uh, uh, this document, this important committee of the United Nations specifies that as long as goods, products, and services are open or provided to the public, they must be accessible to all, regardless of whether they are owned uh, and or uh, provided by a public authority or a private enterprise. And this is very important. Uh, it is crucial for the implementation of the accessibility provisions of the EU telecom package given that this sector is mainly managed by private companies. So it is crucial that neither the national regulatory authorities nor the private entities create or, or accept new barriers in the access to telecommunication services, provoking new ways of discrimination to persons with, uh, with disabilities. We go to slide four, where uh, I would like to say something about a study on uh, assessing and uh, promoting e accessibility, the, the so called MEAC study uh, three. So, the last available and official data uh, that we have concerning the provision of equal access and choice in uh, telecommunications comes from the study on accessing and promoting e-accessibility, also known as MEAC. The study was published by the European Commission in November 2013. It collects data from the, 20, from the 27 EU member states at the time, uh, Croatia came later, plus four non-EU countries for comparative reasons. These countries were the United States, Canada, Norway, and Australia. The study is divided in three sections, web accessibility, telecommunications, uh, telecommunications, and TV. Unfortunately, it shows that the EU as a whole is lagging behind 
in providing accessibility for persons with disabilities in these three IC domains. As for telecommunications, the study focuses on some areas in which accessibility can play an important role. And this includes directory services, payphones, provisions of relay services, text and video, provisions of special equipment, and emergency services. Uh, so let's, we, let's go quickly uh, to this main important three areas. Directory services are important. And concerning accessible, th these services, uh, we can be seen from this table uh, on the screen. There are currently 21 countries where any provisions are available. Uh, these include 17 European member states and all of the four non-EU uh, countries. In most of the cases, alternative means of accessibility, uh, the traditional uh, video phone, uh, um, book, the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the traditional telephone, to the traditional telephone book are put in place and in some cases supported by dedicated support services uh, such as uh, helplines or workstations uh, for those who find it difficult to use the directory service. As a matter of fact, these directories are not accessible in those countries which do not have an explicit requirement to make them accessible. About payphones, we can say that although this, uh, the adoption of mobile uh, telephony services uh, and payphones has become a bit obsolete for many people. And so I think that uh, uh, this is an area which is, uh, let's say, getting less important with the time passing. Next slide, uh, seven, we go to relay services, which on the contrary are very important. This fragmentation in the approach is even more evident in the number of countries enabling relay services for those who need an alternative way of communication to the voice. These services can be video relay services, as you know, text relay services, and real-time text. There is a considerable variation with regard to the implementation of those services across the European countries, where some have some uh, such services at pilot experiences. Other enable these services only during working hours. <coughs> and some others provide the service only through one operator, which is uh, considered the uh, universal service provider in that country. Special equipment is the next issue. The Universal Service Directive explicitly requires member states to encourage the availability of terminal equipment of uh, offering the functional features required by users with disabilities in order to have equivalent access to telecommunication services. These requirements obliges to allow interoperability with assistive technologies needed by persons with disabilities, such as compatibility of headphones with hearing aids. The study shows, uh, once again, a great variation in the implementation of this uh, requirement. Although we acknowledge that the manufacturers are improving the accessibility features built up in their devices, there are still some countries that have not yet adopted any obligation concerning the accessibility of terminal equipment. And this can result in an, uh, unnecessary barriers when persons with disabilities uh, try to access terminal equipment in other places than uh, in, their, in their private homes. 
about emergency services, the availability of alternative access, other um, alternative access modes uh, for people with disabilities in emergency services, again, differs a lot across member states. Regrettably, in some countries, emergency services are still limited to voice telephony. SMS is the most common alternative communication mode, and uh, in some of the countries, um, and in some of these countries, a pre-registration in the service is needed, which excludes persons with disabilities traveling to those countries. Emergency services can also be reached through uh, relay services, at least in principle, although in some countries <coughs> it's not offered on a 24-hour basis. Uh, now something I think particularly interesting is to give an idea of the barriers encountered by uh, persons with disabilities on the basis of a response from uh, their national organizations. Before this workshop, we have uh, sent out a quick consultation among EDF member organizations, and these are the main barriers notified uh, to, from the organizations representing persons with disabilities <coughs> at national level. And we will provide a more comprehensive analysis when the public consultation uh, from BEREC concerning equal access and choice will be, will be launched. <coughs> First of all, persons with disabilities living in the remote areas and in some countries uh, in a more vulnerable situation, since there is uh, often no choice or less choice of accessible services, in some cases even uh, inexistent. Sometimes users with disabilities are not aware of the availability of these services. Products and services for persons with disabilities are uh, procured outside the mainstream procurement of products and services. So we want pro procurers to purchase products and services designed for all. There is a lack of involvement of the organization representing persons with disabilities in the national regulatory authorities. Some of our organizations have raised the difficulty to liaise properly with their NRAs. Some NRAs have two business, are too business oriented. Some of our members have noticed the power of big operators on NRAs and at the same time that they are uh, neglected or ignored. Non-accessibility information, e.g. websites of telecom uh, providers, there are sometimes no requirements by NRAs to make uh, their websites accessible. It also happens that only the web page concerning users with disabilities is accessible, while the rest of uh, the operator's website remain inaccessible. NRAs like of, uh, lack of guidance for users and uh, providers in understanding accessibility provisions. In some cases, NRAs poses an obligation to make a service accessible without specifying how exactly the operator, the operator shall act and what users can expect from a service. And finally, there is also a lack of regular monitoring at national and European level. So we believe four years between the, uh, the publication of the uh, report issued by BEREC on this important matter is not enough to assess whether further initiatives at EU level Shall be, uh, shall be undertaken. And let's conclude with some recommendations. 
one minute or two minutes, to NRAs, first of all. The recital nine of the Universal Service Directive states that additional measures can be adopted by uh, referring to e-accessibility standards. One year ago, the European standard on accessibility uh, EN uh, 301549, you can find it, title Accessibility Requirements Suitable for Public Procurement of ICT's Products and Services was adopted. There you will find the technical specifications, how a ride uh, um, for a wide range of uh, technologies, such as web, software, documents, uh, ICT with uh, two-way voice communication, ICT with video fe uh, features, ICT providing relay or emergency services, etc. It will be important to refer uh, to this. And the race should also add conditions to the general authorization to deliver e-communication services in their respective countries and ensure a wide definition of terminal equipment intended for uh, persons with disabilities. And it's good that they place the same requirements on all service providers and not just to a single universal service provider as this is uh, the only way to ensure real possibility of choice. Uh, unfortunately, my time is over <laughs> and I have to stop here, but I could continue for a few minutes. But anyway, what is fundamental is that collaboration with uh, Barrick continues, and I think that the conditions for a good cooperation are there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Catani. Uh, I think at the end we're going to have the opportunity to receive questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, I would like now to ask uh, the second speaker, Mr. Hay, uh, to start his presentation. Mr. Hay, <coughs> the floor is, is yours. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm going to first of all explain quickly what the European Union of the Deaf is. So if I can go to the next slide, please. As Rodolfo Catani said, he talked about the European uh, Disability Forum. Um, um, we're a member. Uh, um, we are part of the General Assembly and one of the contributors to the strategy and the work of the European Disability Forum as the European Union of the Deaf. And we also have national associations of the deaf as our members. There are five board members um, overseeing the work that we do and the strategy of the organization. Next. And we also have uh, four permanent members of staff that work full time, uh, a small team, and we have uh, interns twice a year coming in to work within our organization. The EUD uh, does have a vision, and that is equality in public and private life for deaf people all, all over Europe in three key areas. The recognition of our sign languages and the use of our sign languages, empowerment through communication and information, which is obviously highly relevant to today's workshop on accessibility, and our final uh, third foundation pillar is equality in education and employment. <coughs> you can see the statistics in this slide, which depicts the number of people uh, who use sign language um, in the European Union, numbering 715,000 people, a significant number indeed. And when you consider that there are only 9,900 registered sign language interpreters, then we have a very poor ratio of 73 users per interpreter. Now, when you consider um, relay services through telecommunications, you can imagine the problems that this will present. Um, this summarizes the key areas of the work that we undertake every day uh, at the European Union of the Deaf. The first of these is that we work with the European Parliament, with um, MEPs, hoping to influence and lobby uh, legislation and the strategy of the key European institutions. Um, we're not the only representative deaf association working uh, on the worldwide stage. There is the World Federation of the Deaf, of the EDF, which we've previously um, heard about today, the European Union of Deaf Youth, the European Forum of Sign Language Interpreters, and other organizations uh, such as the European Platform of Deafness, 
hard of hearing and deaf blindness. So we have joint um, workshops, we share information and work together in key strategic areas. We aim very much to do pretty much what I'm doing now. A sign language user standing at the front of a workshop providing some high visibility to our, our issues and our language. We always uh, make sure that our information is as widely accessible uh, through social media and on our website as much as possible, and we very much work on and have been recognized for our work in this area. Again, as has been recognized, we're very much focused on um, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and as Rodolfo mentioned earlier on, um, Article 9, um, I will be covering too, uh, and I'll be, I'm happy to say that um, our organizations are obviously very much singing from the same song sheet when it comes to how important this convention is to accessibility for di disabled people. Now, one of the key strategic um, areas of work that we have at the EUD is accessibility of information and communication for deaf people. For us to fully access information um, in the real world, it's simply not a reality at the moment. Most information is available in text or through voice and spoken languages, leaving deaf people very much behind in the race for information and communication. <coughs> so just as I said, um, it's Article 9 in the UNCRPD. Um, it does uh, mention emergency services and access to video um, telephony. Um, now, in terms of emergency services, I mean, the, the original proposal was to do it through fax and text services, but we've obviously increased our understanding, and as technology has improved, we've put interpreters and video relay services at the forefront, allowing sign language users immediate, fast, real-time access on an equitable basis. And this is very much what we're proposing now. Now this area is, for, for this year, is going to be one of the biggest um, parts of our work, the European Accessibility Act. Now this is something that we hope to, have, that was hoped to be enacted, but has uh, had gone through many uh, considerations uh, and is still uh, not enacted. So um, there's the EU Web Accessibility Directive which does influence the European Union uh, in terms of following a, spe a specified framework, um, it's very, very important um, for us to be consulted and to be involved in the process that determines the direction of these moves. Now, this is really to do with how written text um, is translated and made accessible in sign language, in a visual format, or in easy to read text, also uh, explained through other visual means such as video or uh, so it, when you it's to do with translating uh, written text into all sorts of visually available formats not only sign language so this covers instructions and general information that comes from institutions and other organizations Now, to look at video relay services and to focus on uh, uh, that and real-time captioning services, the European Commission did fund uh, a pilot project um, at the EU level. And that is really for MEPs, for members of the European Parliament, to um, be accessible, as well as certain uh, European institutions, <coughs> so that deaf people um, can communicate with those MEPs and institutions. So the project was to see how this um, could work in reality. So if you imagine, uh, instead of releasing a press release on, in text, you could do it through video. And I'll be showing a video as to how this works. Now, time is against us. Um, we had a technical problem earlier on before the workshop started. The sound wasn't working, I believe, in these videos. Um, now, these videos normally do have sound on them. Um, so um, perhaps the interpreter can do an impromptu voiceover, or perhaps we may just let people watch the subtitles. Um, so uh, <laughs> with live interpreting, as you know, um, it's an imperfect science. So we'll see how he manages. 
Okay. So there's video playing with the InSign logo. Hmm. <coughs> it looks like we have a video technology problem as well as a sound problem. Uh, Mark Wheatley, the executive officer, saying, I want to welcome those initially here. The first step for deaf people is to enable access to the European institutions. This is Adam Kosa, a Hungarian deaf MEP, um, who's currently signing. There's a slide that's entitled, What is InSign? We're currently looking at footage of a meeting that's undergoing and being interpreted. The subtitles are saying to give the present and the future to our common project. I think I might um, stop the video there because it seems to be uh, not running too smoothly. Yeah, I don't think it's being very, I don't think it's playing very clearly for you. But essentially what this was, this, this video press release, if you like, was to explain that the Video Relay project had, had two demonstration events. This was the second demonstration event to show um, people from the institutions um, how the Video Relay interpreting and the Video Relay service could work, whereby a deaf person can um, contact an interpreter in a number of different countries using their own sign language, um, for example, I could use British Sign Language, so I could be in the UK as a British Sign Language user. Um, I could want to call my MEP who's situated in Brussels, so I'm in London. I'd like to call my local MEP who's got their office in Brussels. The call would then connect um, to a BSL video relay service, um, which would be situated somewhere in the UK. They would then call the MEP's office and relay the call between myself in the UK um, and an MEP. So I would be able to see the interpreter, they would see me, and then make a voice call to the MEP's office. That's how, essentially how the service would work. It's also a real-time captioning service as another option. So as you can see, um, this is a project that incorporates sign language. Uh, I think it was British, there was French sign language, a variety of different national sign languages. That could, so we had a very positive event. The pilot project was a great success um, and, and was proof of concept indeed that video telephony and real-time captioning could indeed work. This video, by the way, when it works, um, has sign language, subtitles and voice. So giving full accessibility to all. Unfortunately, um, not today, though. <laughs> So just to reiterate, the EU aims to, by role modeling uh, a, an appropriate approach um, to accessibility, get away from A4 written English on bits of paper that are simply not accessible. We make our videos visual. We make sure that it's accessible in a number of different forms so that other people with different communication needs um, can access it. So as I said, we hope to role model um, using uh, also simple written language when written language is necessary. And by doing that, we hope to provide exposure of um, the EUD's work and sign languages through uh, the medium of video te telephony, mobile video telephony, and all these visual formats. Now, I have another video that I was going to show, but um, I'm scared to try it in case it doesn't work again. But it's a case study whereby the European president and a board member visited the European Parliament um, to do some lobbying work. And, well, basically in terms of accessibility and web accessibility. Now, normally we uh, put out information on video about how we do it. Um, so I'm going to try and play this video again. And fingers crossed that everything works. So uh, let's see how we go. Okay. 
Well, I'm not going to be able to show that example. Maybe it would be a good idea for me to email uh, Berek directly, and then you can all access um, the videos that way, um, and you can look at them in your own in your own time. Uh, the video basically showed the uh, EUD president and a board member um, having discussions with MEPs, talking about. Uh, using sign language, subtitles, and the, the video itself shows how you can transform information, making it visual, making it accessible, and like I say, the EUD role modeling, how you put out uh, uh, video and visual information. Would it be possible to Oh, perfect, my timing is absolutely perfect. That's my last slide. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. All right, uh, now I would like to, to ask the last speaker of this session, Mr. Uh, um, Kaderboom, uh, uh, from uh, representing <laughs> Funka New, to present uh, his presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andreas Kaderboom, um, and I work for a company called Funka New. And uh, I would li like to start just by, by giving you a few. Um, a little bit of information about who we are and what we do. So Funka was actually started in the 90s by the collective Swedish disability movement. And the goal was to create a website with information for persons with disabilities and a website that also could be managed with, by persons with disabilities. So by doing this, um, um, the, the project started by, by re reading the guidelines that was uh, present at the time for how to create a web, internet, uh, web content, uh, sorry, uh, for, for how to create a website that would work with people with disabilities. So, and those guidelines is called Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So the project team set out and read these guidelines and created a website and tested it with real users with disabilities and saw that the result wasn't good. The users couldn't use the website, even though we had followed the VCAG uh, as far as we could. So the project has to go back and, and rebuild and try and, and rebuild and, and test with real users until they had a solution that actually worked. And this, uh, uh, this failure, this initial failure, is something that we bring with us today. So we try to test everything with real users before we recommend anything to, to our customers. In, the, in uh, 2000, the project ended and uh, the key pers persons in the project started the company Funka. So Funka has been uh, co a company since 2000. And uh, we have an office in Stockholm. Uh, we also have an office in Oslo since 2010 and an office in Madrid since 2013. And today we are about 35 employees. Um, and we are... We're also one of the co-founders of the International Association for Accessibility Professionals, IAAP. And, but our daily work uh, consists of consulting. So we develop websites. We uh, are analyzing everything, really, for accessibility. So we work with buildings. We work with uh, web. We work with uh, software. We work with brochures and uh, information kiosks and everything that that a user come in contact with. But mostly we are known for our web accessibility work and that's what I'm going to talk to you about mostly. So the, the, the more interesting things we do, we, we do the consulting so we get money to do the other things that we really like to do. So the things we like to do is research, uh, government uh, assignments, co collaboration <laughs> projects and standardization because we want to, we want to uh, continue developing the accessibility field because we see that today we aren't we aren't in a, a reality where everyone has the equal possibilities. So we need to work with developing accessibility. Right now, I got a, a colleague that's getting a PhD on on uh, in, in Sweden in the field of cognitive disability, uh, cognitive accessibility. So accessibility for people with cognitive disabilities. And also right now we're working on a project uh, for the commission to develop a methodology, methodology to monitor web accessibility across Europe. So this has just started and uh, will we'll, uh, go on the rest of the year. 
our view of what accessibility is, we see accessibility as three, three equal pieces. We have the technical accessibility, we have the pedagogical accessibility, and we have the accessibility of the content. What we saw in the first project that started our company was that we can build something that, that is technically uh, completely accessible, <coughs> but at the same time have something that not the user is able to use. Because there are pedagogical problems, they don't know how to find the information in the website or in the interface, they don't know how to proceed, they don't know what's expected from them. Or if they actually can find the information at the end, they don't understand it. So all these three pieces must come together to get an accessible interface. And that's, of course, we, we work very, very much with web, but this is also important if you work with an application or a software for an information kiosk or an ATM machine or, or whatever interface you are presenting for the user. And unfortunately today, um, many of the guidelines and standardizations, standardization work that is, is, is done is focused on the technical part. So for web accessibility, we have the Web Accessibility Content Accessibility Guidelines, VCAG. And the VCAG guidelines is the guidelines that are used across the world when we talk about web accessibility and how to make it accessible. And, and those guidelines are very good on technic, uh, technical issues, but they don't cover uh, pedagogical uh, content issues at all, or just, just uh, a, a few uh, guidelines on, on the lowest level that no one actually uses. Um, our, our work um, is to collect difficulties, I, I normally say. So we try to find with users with different types of problems. So, uh, and there, there's no stop to the things that can be program problematic for a user. So we have users in our user tests that, that uh, see everything upside down, for example. That's a bit disturbing. <laughs> Very, uh, and we have a user that, that comes to our user test that, that he's got a, a brain damage. He, he, he manages to get to our office. He managed to do the user testing, but he man don't, don't manage to get home. So we try to see everything that a human being can have problems with and try to develop interfaces that work with everyone. And this doesn't mean to make something that is uh, ugly or something that's not, not, not good for everyone else. This is about creating solutions that everyone wants to use. And we, have, we haven't so far found any user in any of our user tests that has told us that this was too easy. So we're still looking for that one. And of course, you can, have, you can have difficulty to read, to understand, to, to remember, to see, and so on, because uh, of a disability. But you also can have these problems because of other things. So if you're tired, for example, you do the same, prob uh, same errors a, that a person with a cognitive disability do. If you have your mother-in-law uh, to visit, you will also be stressed and do the same things. If you're using a mobile smartphone outside, you will have visual problems and you will have motorical problems. So you will have problems even though you don't have a disability. And if we have created interfaces that work fine with the people that have the biggest problems, then it's also better for everyone in all situations. So this is our, this is our work. This is what we would like to do. And of course, um, yeah, users are like unicorns. We haven't yet found the normal user, the standardized, standardized user that everyone wants to have. We haven't found that one yet. So users are like unicorns. And of course, when we talk about web accessibility, uh, we have the VCAG. And this is guidelines <laughs> that were developed, uh, the, the current guideline was developed and uh, released in 2008. So, this is mostly technical focus on these guidelines. And also, it's very much focused on assistive technology and visual impairments. So it's quite good on these issues, but it's, it's lacking in other areas. Uh, for example, since they were released in 2008, 
we have uh, guidelines telling us that if you develop an interface for a web, uh, it should be possible to navigate it with a keyboard. And that's an important thing. It's important for some users with motorical problems, and it's important for visual impaired users. But there is nothing about the touch screen. It doesn't state that it should be easy to, to click on areas on your mobile phones or something like that. There isn't anything about using a mouse either, even though these te technologies are better for many users. So there are, uh, there are so, so, some areas that the VCAG doesn't cover good enough. And cognitive is missing, of course. But the VCAG is the baseline. This is what we've got. And it, of course, it's easier to create guidelines that are technical. We can create a, a set of guidelines telling us how high this, this uh, speaker table should be. We can create uh, guidelines for how wide a door should be to get in with a wheelchair. But it's much uh, harder to create guidelines telling us that this should be easy to use. So, of course, we have the VCAG, and this is the baseline. VCAG is good. You should follow the VCAG guidelines. Um, and we are using them in the EM301549 standard uh, that we've been uh, working uh, on. And, uh, and in, in the EM standard, um, everything software refers to the VCAG. So, even though it's called web content uh, accessibility guidelines, it's also <coughs> applicable if you use, uh, uh, if you have a software or you have an app for a mobile phone or so on. There, there are things in VCAG that you can use anyway. So, so the standard will points to this VCAG as soon as you talk about soft issues, software. Also, the proposed directive uh, from the Commission uh, talk about VCAG and national legislation talk about VCAG. So we work uh, in, in Norway because they have a legislation that is quite good that uh, incorporates uh, accessibility in the, uh, in the discrimination legislation. Uh, but the problem is that we often see that, that VCAG doesn't become the baseline, doesn't become the tool to get an accessible interface. Instead, VCAG becomes the goal. So everyone strives just to make VCAG. So our, we, we struggle with our Norwegian customers because they're only interested in if they meet the VCAG or not. They're not interested if they are accessible, really, because they say, well, it's VCAG that the law is pointing to, so it's VCAG we should follow. And we say, yeah, you should start there, but you should do so much more. But we haven't most of our customers is still just on the VCAG uh, level in uh, Norway. So, um, Rudolfo, Rudolfo talked about MEAC free, so I won't uh, say the same things again. We were also involved in this study and we were working with the web accessibility. So the tests for the web accessibility across Europe was made in 2012 and I, I'm going to take uh, just a few uh, minutes to, to uh, walk you through some of the figures from that study because they are quite interesting to see to, and shows where we are today. So remember I said that VCAG isn't enough. At the same time we have VCAG that is uh, the tool that is used and, and also in, in this study uh, the commission wanted us to, to measure f uh, two VCAG so to see if the websites in Europe are accessible according to VCAG. So what we did was we, we, uh, we did 10 tests, 10 different accessibility tests uh, connected to VCAG on each website. And in each country we had 12 websites. So it was quite a lot of tests. And uh, each test could, uh, could have a score of two points that was completely fulfilled. One point was partly fulfilled and zero point was not fulfilled. And uh, what we did was we, we uh, we took the combined score of all websites in each country, and then we, we calculated the percentage. So zero means that no website got any point on any test, and 100% means that every website on that, in that country scored two points on every test. So they made, uh, they made every test we, was, we were able to make on the, those websites. 
And if we look at the res oh. and if we look at the results on the trends, we saw this is not, not revolu no revolution, but but the newer sites are better than older sites. We saw that, that if, so if, you had done so, if they had done something for accessibility, it most often was something that was good for uh, blind users. But there, there, there were more rarely uh, issues, um, there were more rarely things done for other groups. So, so even though blind users often have big problems accessing the information, uh, if, if you talk to people out uh, working with websites, if they heard something about accessibility, it's that blind users can't see images. Um, we saw it was far too little multimedia, far too little video. Video is a good uh, way of informing users. Uh, today, I think the second biggest uh, uh, search engine is YouTube. So after Google, people go to YouTube to search for information. So people like video, they like multimedia to give them information, but there, there was very little of that out in, in the, on the European sites. Also in countries with poor economy, uh, the private websites did better than the public websites. And of course, this is probably to, do, to uh, some, have something to do with that newer but sites are better than old ones. And, and this is a, an interesting trend because Newer websites are more search engine, optim search engine optimized. They use newer technology which are more accessible. So a newer website is typically more accessible. There are, of course, countless examples of the opposite, but, but uh, in, in, uh, as, as, uh, as a trend, that's, that's still true. And if we look at the, if we look at the results, if, this if, is... If I, if I would ask in a couple of minutes more, because I would like five minutes for questions, please. Yep. Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah. So just, uh, if we look at the total score, this is for the, uh, for the countries. We see that um, the span was from 32 to 69 percent. So no one was near 100 percent. This was about 50-50 if they made the tests or not. If we look at, at issues, uh, tests that were targeted to, to accessibility things that's also covered with search engine optimization and, and that's typical made in your website, we saw that, that the span was from 30% to 94%. So here we, we actually touch almost at 100%. So, so this is, well, yeah. In countries with good economy, they have newer websites, they are more accessible, and they are, are, are almost touching 100% of the, the, in, in the scores. But if we look on, in the, on, uh, on tests that are only uh, met if you actually have read VCAG and understand VCAG, tests that's not fulfilled just because you search engine optimize or just because you build a new website, the score was from 0% to 42%. And this is where, I think this is very interesting because this shows something to us. This shows how much how, or how, how little focus there has been on accessibility. We're still after. Um, three quick examples. Uh, I borrowed your, uh, your website here. Uh, visually, we see three headlines here, headings here. If you, you work with search engine optimization, you know that headings is important for Google. So you will use the HTML heading codes to present these as headings. At the same, same time, you do this page more accessible for blind users because uh, if you're blind, you can't see that this text is bigger and bolder than the other text. So you can't understand that it's a heading if not the, this code is in place. So this is norm typically done correctly. Uh, another thing that's not typically done correctly is links. This, uh, in this image, we have one link, it's blue, so you can see that you can click on it. But if you can't see colors, then you have new, no cue that this is a clickable area. And uh, this is something that, that wasn't uh, met by, by many websites. The, the designers do normally see colors good, and they design websites so th uh, that they are color dependent. And of course, uh, but that, that, that has been in the VCAG one, so they, that has been in the guidelines since the 90s. 
If we look in, in VCAG 2, we have uh, guidelines telling us that if you navigate with a keyboard, with a tab, tab key to get ar around the website, you need to have a visual cue of where the focus is. So in this website, you have a, a border around the link that's got focus. So you can see where you are when you navigate with keyboard. This is only introduced in VCAG 2.0, and it was just a handful of the 374 websites we, we studied that actually met this criteria. So the road to success. What do we see? Yeah, well, we see that countries where the legislation isn't too precise do better. So if the legislation tells us follow VCAG, then the accessibility level isn't good. But if the legislations tell us that if you feel, dis if you feel discriminated because this, this, you have a disability and you can't access the information, then they tend to, to drive the accessibility work forward. We see that good policies and guidelines are important to, to help the industry implement accessibility in a good way. We also see that the industry needs to be competent. To, they need to know what accessibility is. And we see that the user organizations is extremely important to drive this, this work forward. Last slide. So to, to move forward, we need to, to work with awareness. We need to work with uh, awareness in the industry, among the users, among the companies building. We need to work with requirements. We need to introduce more user testing, and not just user testing with the <laughs> normal user, but user testing with users with different kind of abilities. And we need to work with the monitoring. And finally, again, there is no such thing as a normal user. Thank you. I would like to thank all the speakers. And I believe we have uh, still some time uh, just for one or two questions. So I would like to ask uh, uh, the audience uh, who would like to, to ask questions to speakers, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, I thank you all, all the speakers uh, for their uh, very good uh, interventions. I think that Mr. Katani could not finish his presentation and he had, uh, he, I think he would like to stress some recommendations to European Union institutions. Can you please show what uh, these recommendations would be? Thank you. All right. Uh, Should I do it now? Uh, no, do, do you need a presentation, or you could just? Uh, no, no, I have. Right. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. Uh, not easy to. Yeah, it's you see, it's not yeah. accessible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> concerning concerning the uh, at you at EU level, we would like to say that we need uh, an ongoing mechanism to provide guidance to the national uh, regulatory authorities on how to achieve accessibility for uh, persons with disabilities. And so pursue what is extremely important, a harmonization of the EU uh, uh, telecommunication market. It would also be important to have uh, regulatory um, to have a regular to, to the end of monitoring we should also have a regular benchmark reporting exercise on both uh, access and choice because these are the two most important and uh, this uh, should be available and uh, publicly, in order that uh, people uh, that people can uh, can have the the necessary information. <coughs> Another important issue, <coughs> sorry, is the involvement of users' organization, because this is, uh, I would say, important not only for the organizations themselves in order to uh, make known their, their, their needs and specific proposal, but also for the regulatory authorities, which could concentrate on the most important, on the most important issue. And of course, there is also uh, the need to, um, 
make more, uh, to have more awareness on the rights of European citizens concerning accessibility in the, in the field of e-communications. I think this, the preconditions for a positive development in future is, first of all, the fact that we need now, we strongly need, the European Accessibility Act to be uh, proposed by the European Commission in order to start a new, uh, a really new approach to the problem of accessibility of goods and services. Goods and services now, with the technical evolution, sometimes become less accessible. Um, for blind people, for example, there has been the transition to uh, touch screen uh, technology, which has been created many problems. But there, is, there were two kinds of response. The response of uh, clever companies and the response of companies which did not understand the importance of getting this accessible. And the difference was that the clever companies sold much more devices than the other ones. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is it anyone else who would like to ask a question? I see someone over there. Yes, please. Hi. I hope you. So, so my question was that in the Netherlands, my understanding from my colleagues from Vodafone Netherlands is that the KPM provide all the universal services. Yeah. And my question from a user perspective is, what is the feedback from the users um, from the Netherlands if you have that, if that works well, or if there's disadvantages with that system from a user? And. Uh, uh, who would like to, to answer that? Is uh, I'm a little bit. I don't know anything about that. Really. Yeah, this is more a specific problem in the area of, of Barrack, I think. Okay. Uh, if that's the case, because uh, we are already four minutes uh, late. I would like to thank all the speakers for their presentations and uh, for all the audience for, for the time and uh, their, their attention. I would like also to, uh, to thank all the interpreters for their effort to make this session accessible to all. Uh, before we finish, I would like to mention that it was a great privilege for me to, and a very good education to hear your views today. And uh, as a member of the Berwick office, I promise that I will promote your ideas to my colleagues at the regulatory authorities across Europe, and I will have your request in mind every time we develop regulatory policy. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. <coughs>